Written and read by Marshall Messer. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Dylan Thomas. All life is six to five against. Damon Runyon. Chapter One, Belmont. The captain and Jeannie always went to the track together. It was a Saturday ritual they had. For a while, I tagged along. At the time, I was renting a furnished room in the dreary apartment of a divorced cab driver on the Upper West Side. Lipschitz, his name was, which was perfect because he would start cursing from the moment he woke up. What a piece of work he was always carping about his ex-wife. I could understand why she divorced him, but I could never figure out why she married him in the first place. As his part of the settlement, Lipschitz inherited the lease on their dilapidated railroad flat. The extra rooms he rented to various schnooks and losers who called the place the penthouse as though it were a swanky residence. True, it happened to be on the top floor. But the only sense in which the penthouse was desirable was as a way station for social misfits. Alvin Lipschitz, what a character. He converted the living room and the dining room into bedrooms so there wasn't even a common area where you could socialize or watch TV. Guys would congregate in the tiny kitchen with its grimy, claustrophobic view of the air shaft, complaining bitterly about jobs, bosses, women, kids, and ex-spouses, or else they'd loiter in the long, narrow hallway like stranded commuters on a subway platform. Lipschitz had a mini-fleet of two checkers, each of them held together with spit and scotch tape. The door handle was always popping off, the trunk was twisted fast with a coat hanger, and the meter had to be smacked just right to get it to start. What did I know? In no time I was driving a cab five days a week, on top of working for my father. After what I was used to, it was like a sharp stick in the eye. I was new to the city, uprooted from the familiar routines of college life, working these grueling twelve-hour shifts and flopping in this dark, depressing apartment. The one thing I lived for were those Saturday afternoons at the track. Saturday mornings I'd buy the racing form, sit in a luncheonette on Broadway and handicap over hotcakes or scrambled eggs. Then I'd hop on the subway and take the train out to Belmont. If they were racing at Aqueduct, we'd meet there. One thing about the track, it was the only place I could get along with the captain. I was in hot water again, and things were pretty rocky between us. Five months earlier, at the end of the fall semester of my senior year, I had flunked out of college. Saturday, June 9th, instead of participating in graduation exercises with my class in upstate New York, I was on Long Island betting on the ponies. I could tell you I was painfully in touch with the magnitude of my failure, that I was racked by guilt, mortified with shame, tortured by regret, but that would be a lie. Any uncomfortable feelings I had, I managed all too easily to repress beneath the pangs of elation I felt whenever it occurred to me that on this momentous day for my classmates, I was playing hooky. I remember thinking, guilt is such a stupid emotion. Here I was at Belmont Park, my favorite place in the world, for the running of the Belmont Stakes, the biggest race of the year. I felt as if I'd been invited to an exclusive party, me and 70,000 other lucky guests for whom the long lines and the crowds were scant inconvenience for a shot at seeing the first Triple Crown winner in 25 years. More than a mere spectator, I could well be an eyewitness to racing history. What was I supposed to do? Feel bad? So I'm at Belmont, right? And I'm feeling like I've died and gone to racing heaven. Nothing bothers me. Not the crowds. Not the abominable weather. Not the snail-paced wagering lines in the clubhouse swollen with penny-ante betters. Not the twenty-minute traffic jam at the concession counter or the ten-minute wait for the men's room. Not even the clubhouse dress code that requires gentlemen to be properly attired. So what if we're packed in like the subway at rush hour? regulars and first-timers in their summer sport coats, 
wasps from the New York Racing Association in their boring blazers and khakis, our smiles congealed and foreheads glazed as we slowly, courteously, immaculately roast to death. The only sport jacket I own is of tan corduroy, so in this relentless heat I'm a walking sponge. Patches of sweat clot the cotton work shirt to my armpits. Trickles of sweat saturate the small of my back. Beads of sweat sprout on my forehead and every now and then plop onto the racing form, speckling the past performance charts. What do I care? Nothing bothers me because I'm winning. 